Welcome to News Click. We are once again going to be discussing the Rafale scam with uh, D. Raghunandan, our defense expert. Raghu, the petitioners have filed a review petition uh, on the Rafale matter where they've asked the, uh, the, the court uh, and the three uh, judge bench to review the matter in an open court uh, rather than closed door. Also because the government itself has asked for modifications, which they say is actually uh, an application for review in disguise. But there are several issues that they have pointed out and certain several errors. The main thrust of their prayer is that the, uh, that the paragraph 25, which contains reference to the CAG report uh, having been prepared and been given to the PSC, uh, turned out to be erroneous. Yes. Uh, let's begin with that. Raghu, what do you have to say about that? Well, you see, clearly the court has either misunderstood or misinterpreted or been led to misinterpret hmm. uh, the role of the CAG. It's not because their English competence that is in this. I mean, I would be uh, <laughs> extremely... Uh, 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 wary of pronouncing on the ignorance of three Supreme Court judges, mm. not just one mm. of the English language. Mm. Uh, it looks to me as if the note, mm. which nobody has seen, yeah. uh, has sought to convey the role of the CAG in a manner that is open to misinterpretation. Mm. And the court has interpreted it one way. Uh, and has been led to do so by the language in which it had been written in the, by, by the government in its uh, note, which seemed to suggest that uh, facts had been placed before the CAG and then which went on to say procedurally that this would be placed before parliament and the PAC, etc., which the court has interpreted as saying this has been done. Okay. Now, uh, the language or the wording of the note may itself have been misleading, but the fact is CAG knows about it, has been made aware of it, and in fact, the CAG has stalled on the issue of looking into this for over three years. That itself should have been the subject mm -hmm. of some inquiry or investigation mm. or comment and concern by the Supreme Court and the fact that it wasn't mm. itself surprises me. But there is no CAG report. So no. the question of having it been presented to the Public Accounts Committee does not Absolutely. arise does and not therefore arise. even the question of placing it before the Quite Parliament right. does not come into play. Quite right. But on this whole question of sealed envelope, now sealed envelope contains material which are not by nature of affidavit. Do you find anything very uh, disturbing about that because a sealed envelope is presented to a court which looks at it, which is not signed or in form of an affidavit yeah. where the government can always uh, take plausible deniability of, you know, yes. and, and, and uh, That's right. uh, raise its hand and say that they're, right. they're, they're clean. What do you think, what do you make of that in a matter of this nature? See, there are several issues involved with this note. One is that it's an apparently an unsigned note. Nobody knows who is the author. Mm. It's not in the form of an affidavit. So one does not know who the note is from. Is it from the Prime Minister? Is it from the government? Is it from the cabinet? Is it from the Attorney General? Nobody knows. Mm. So if one does not know the authorship of the note, uh, what status does the note have Correct. for the court to base its ruling on that uh, mm. note? To me, that itself is uh, problematic. Uh, that the note is unsigned, unaverred, is not stated in the form of a legal document mm. uh, and is therefore open to any refutation or denial. Uh, the petitioners tomorrow. point out something. Petitioners point out that if the government, they believe that the government was deliberately misleading the Supreme Court by using is rather than will. If they had replaced is, <laughs> with will, they might have been better off well, if they were know, being the point, honest. The point is, if the 
uh, language of the note had been less ambiguous, mm. then I think the court may have uh, interpreted the outcome differently. Mm. Maybe the court was led into believing that the mm. CAG has placed the report before Parliament, which was not uh, maybe what was stated in the note, but uh, this is something which we can't say okay. since nobody has seen mm. the note. Uh, the other issue that they have raised in their petition is the question of the conflation of conflating Reliance industry with Reliance yes. infrastructure. Yes. One owned by Mukesh Ambani, the other owned by Anil yeah. Ambani. Yeah. Whereas the court is treating uh, the company as one and the same. Yes. That is rather uh, problematic. See, this is a uh, part of a series of problematic aspects of the Supreme Court ruling, they all stem from the fact that either the court should have said these are matters pertaining to defense and security, the court has no jurisdiction mm. or the court has no interest at this stage to mm. inquire into this and should have then said we have no further comment on this matter, let concerned agencies, CBI, CAG, PAC, inquire into it, which was in fact what the petitioners had asked exactly. for, that CBI should inquire into it. Yeah. If the Supreme Court had made a set of pronouncements which this particular petition had not asked for, hmm. it should have done so after inquiry, which the court had no time for, they seem to have made all their rulings and order based purely on the statements of the government which the court seems to have accepted at face value. Or what was not said by the Indian Air Force officers. Well, in the case of the Indian Air Force officers, uh, they asked the Indian Air Force officers fairly irrelevant questions about which generation of aircraft do these belong to, uh, which was not part of the petition or what they were asked to go in for uh, uh, at all. The court has also said that they had asked the Air Force officers about pricing and process, which is not the case. The court, the officers were not asked these questions. The problem is, as I said, is that the court has decided to rule on process, procedure and pricing without having gone into the issue, hmm. without having itself conducted an inquiry or relied on agencies who could have been entrusted with such an inquiry. I don't think the court had either the time or the uh, preparation or the expertise to, go to have those. gone into all these uh, questions at all. And if that was the case, why rule on it? What about privilege, the issue of privilege that the government tried to invoke? Now, it has been pointed out by the petitioners, Yashwan Sinha, Arun Shori and Prashant Bhushan in the petition that never before has privilege been invoked in this manner when the government has in other dealings with the South aviation for instance never felt compelled by privilege to hide the pricing details either from CAG right. or the public accounts committee. Right and in this case also it was made clear by the French government and by the French president that the issue of privilege pertains to issues of national security armaments, etc. Pricing was up to the Indian government, he stated very clearly Correct. as to what the Indian government wanted to share with parliament or with its people. So there was no particular privilege as far as pricing uh, was concerned. But once again, the court seems to have accepted the government's statement uh, at face value that there was a privilege attached to the uh, price. They also, the petitioners also refer to the role of Manohar Parikar, where they point out Manohar yeah. Parikar is on record yeah. of having said that he played no role in it, yeah. that it was Prime Minister Naren Modi and President François yeah. Hollande yeah. who discussed and came to this agreement on this deal. Absolutely. Uh, and that the, he was not privy to those discussions. Gautam, I am, uh, I'll come back to the point that I was, I've been making from the start of this interview as well as in our earlier interview when the yeah. Supreme Court ruling first came out. To me, the most uh, surprising part of the Supreme Court ruling is that they have pronounced on the legitimacy of the procedure mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. 
without having gone into the details of the procedure, procedure itself and having relied purely on the government's version of it. Why? Whereas, prima facie, hmm. including facts placed in the note by the government itself, hmm. shows that almost all procedures related to the change of the uh, order from 126 aircraft to 36 were done post facto, facto after the PM's announcement. Hmm. Various other requirements hmm. such as the acceptance of necessity by the Air Force hmm. was done subsequently. Hmm. Cabinet Committee on Security Clearance was done subsequently. Hmm. How can any procedure be declared as valid if the entire process has been post facto? Then it renders the entire procedure infructuous. Correct. And this includes declaration of the offset partner, conditions for the offset partner, as to what qualifications the mm. offset partner should have and when the contract was signed and not signed. Mm. All of these are procedures which have been actually done post facto, but which the Supreme Court in its wisdom has accepted as in the normal course because mm. the government has said so. Once again, I find it astonishing that the Supreme Court should have made such rulings mm. without either its own inquiry or inquiry by a competent agency which was in fact the plea of the petitioners. In fact, the petitioners start by pointing out that one of their main prayers was for registering an FIR. Absolutely. Uh, by the CBI. Absolutely. And the Supreme Court has not addressed that prayer Absolutely. at all. So they, there is also a serious lapse in the judgment. For example, if process is involved, the correct agency would have been the CAG mm -hmm. to make a final pronouncement mm -hmm. or before that the CBI if mm -hmm. the FIR had been registered to find out what the procedures were and the sanctity of post facto ratifications, if you like, of processes, hmm. including interference in the process by the National Security Advisor, who has no locus standi in the defense procurement procedures whatsoever. I was going to come to that because the petitioners add that subsequent to their original petition, there are new facts that have come in the That's public right. domain through the caravan story which makes it very clear that the, the negotiating team was split right. and that three senior members objected to hiking of the benchmark price from 5.2 billion to 7.8 billion dollars. Right. Now, this is a new evidence that has come in right. and which also refers to the fact that the government waived the need for sovereign guarantee nor did they bother about bank guarantee from the salt aviation right. for 1.2 billion euros that were right. uh, given to them as advance. Make a very powerful argument in favor of reopening of the issue. Would you agree? Absolutely, because to my mind, from the outset, the main issue has been mm -hmm. a complete disregard to process and procedure. Mm -hmm. That this was an arbitrary decision announced by the Prime Minister, mm. subsequently ratified mm. or compelled to be ratified by mm. relevant mm. Uh, agencies because the Prime Minister had made a commitment in public, okay. which then required such ratification uh, to be done. And in the case in which you mentioned on pricing, etc., in an unprecedented move, it was the Cabinet Committee on Security which had to intervene and overrule all those under normal circumstances any such extraordinary measures hmm. such as post facto ratifications, post facto acceptance of necessity, post facto clearances by cabinet committee on security would itself have called for special investigations by somebody or the other. Correct. If it's not by the CAG, then by the CBI or by a joint parliamentary uh, committee. None of which has happened, but unfortunately, the Supreme Court has contributed to a whitewashing of this by ruling based on a, an anonymous government note. Trying to put the lid on an issue which, which deserves to be... Which has effectively put the lid on it, whereas it has not. In the sense, because you've gone only by yeah. the averment by one side 
in a sealed cover uh, of a note which has not been made public or even given to the petitioners. You were referring to the presence of uh, India's national security advisor as part of the negotiating team. Whereas the negotiating team itself is supposed to be a team which has to remain independent, autonomous. That's right. And not anybody can be deputed to that. At least of all, NSA. Uh, even this seems to have in, escaped... Uh, in fact, Gautam, the rather long and complex defense procurement procedure, which has gone through a series of amendments over mm. 10 years, seeks to provide precisely for a sequential steps of autonomous expert bodies to comment on, discuss, and then um, place its opinion or its decision on relevant uh, issues one after the other so that there is full transparency, consideration of all factors and processes taken into account. If all this can be brushed aside by mm. a pronouncement by the Prime Minister at a press conference and then subsequent ratifications and painting over everything mm. uh, with a brush, then it renders infructuous the entire uh, process of uh, procurement. And I'm seriously astonished that the Supreme Court should have lent its voice to this kind of dealing with the defense procurement procedures. Thank you, Raghu. This is all for now, but Rafal's scam is not going away uh, anytime soon. We'll be back to discuss it when new revelations come to our notice. Thank you for watching News Click. Send us your feedback if you have anything to say to us.